Programming Throwdown, episode 46. Arr. Take it away, Jason. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to have a little rant time here about tabs versus spaces. I don't know if you've had this rant at your work, but uh, um, the Go, like, uh, uh, you know, spec, like the Go, what do you call it? Like the thing that Go just... Lang. Talk- no, no, I know, but the, the document, the, sort, the, the Go style guide um, talks about, you know, using tabs and you actually have to do some like trickery to make it support spaces. And I just, I hate tabs. I mean, here's the thing. I use tabs. I, well, I like the tab button because usually it does not insert a tab. Usually it does something much more useful, like uh, take you to the beginning of a line or something like that. So the tab key can stay, but the tab character, like for me, it's only good for one thing. And that's, I started replacing CSVs, like comma separated value files with TSVs. And the idea is like, you could have a CSV and some of those columns could have commas in them. I mean, it could be, you know, last name, comma, first name as one of the columns, right? Um, And so now you have to like escape it out and do all sorts of craziness, right? But nobody should have a tab. Like the, the tab character is like, should not exist in my opinion. And so it's easy for me to just kill all the tabs, like replace tabs to spaces and all of my data, and then use a tab separated file and just know that there's not going to be any weirdness because the actual data isn't going to have tabs in it. So for that, it's good. The tab character has like one purpose and it's that. But when I see source code with tabs in it, I don't know, it just drives me up the wall, especially open source projects. Uh, I just I don't know why they do that. <laughs> it just drives me crazy. So that's my that's my tabs versus spaces rant. Use use spaces, please, for the love of God. Uh, should we all also stay to eighty character line widths? I don't have. A, do you have an opinion on that? Yes, eighty sucks. It's way too short. Yeah, I know that. So I actually do prefer spaces over tabs, but I've never had a problem where I really cared that badly about it. But I hate 80 character line limits. It's so bad. Yeah, I've never actually um, had 80 characters. So let me think about that. So the other ones I've seen are 100 characters. Yeah, that's what I've had. 100 yeah. is much more reasonable. Right. Uh, probably like I've never seen it, but I can imagine like 120 being better. Like, and you don't want a complete run on line. Like, that's true. But the only time is a few people I know run like 80 character width terminal windows and they run like a bunch of them and then they can like, you know, all their source code they can have side by side. That's just not how I work. So to me, the 80 character is just really short, especially if you get too many indentation levels, which is not too many, but like three or four, right? Like you're in a class, you're, you know, in a function, you're in a, you know, three, four levels down is easy. And then if you're using two spaces per indent, that's already eight spaces gone, right? Like, yep. Another um, thing that like I can't stand and, but I don't really know how to fix it is, you know, Eclipse. Um, I mean, Eclipse does four spaces for, for an indentation level. Now, like you can go into the Eclipse settings and change it to two, but then as soon as you reinstall Eclipse or chain machines or something, now you're back at four. And so, I'm not really sure. Hopefully there's, I could just figure out some way to sort of like maybe tell Eclipse to go look at Dropbox for my style or something like that, Mm. you know? That's what I do with Emacs. Yeah, I use two for indentation level, but then for incomplete line, it's four or whatever. Oh, really? Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, so like if you have a a line which you didn't complete or like a- It wraps around, you mean? You wrap, when you wrap around, yeah, you indent it four on the next line. Oh, I see. That's so cool. It's a good idea. So uh, actually, yeah. this, this like pro tip, everyone, if you use Emacs or VI, um, put your Emacs.d or whatever the equivalent VI is in Dropbox. I mean, that's been a total lifesaver for me. I mean, if... I thought you were going to say if you use Emacs or VI, move forward a decade or two. Oh, come on. <laughs> I love Emacs. Emacs, so, Emacs has support for everything. Like uh, the other day I needed to do Scala and uh, Emacs, it just worked. Like, I just I spent about five seconds, five minutes, uh, you know, finding the Scala package and installing it, and then boom, I had like beautiful, like character, like like you know, uh, syntax highlighting and all that stuff. I mean, like, there's yeah. no editor that has that kind of support. Except maybe Sublime Text is getting there, but that's it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's nice. Uh, yeah, the the problem is like certain parts of the development you just shift it around. So like I do code in that C or in C plus plus, and in bringing it up in like an Eclipse or an IDE, you can typically follow like use the go to definition or go to declaration, and and see that. And yes, I know people do this in like VI or Emacs with the what is it C tags or whatever. Uh, but I've seen very few people yeah. who are on top of it and doing it well enough that like they actually are as efficient and f- getting into a new piece of code and understanding it as I can be by, you know, using an ID and actually going to the definition and whatever. Yeah, um, that's a good point. That's a good point. So when um, I'm browsing around code that I'm not familiar with, it's just so useful to be able to do that. Um, and it, I, it just isn't the same when people use Emacs or VI. They typically end up opening a new window, grepping for the thing, and then, like, may or may not have success. Like, I think, uh, I think you're right. I think if I could get... Um, you know, as I said before, I could, if I could get the Eclipse configuration to somehow sit on Dropbox and synchronize between my laptop and my desktop, and if I could find support for all the languages, like Eclipse would have to be able to do Python and, and uh, you know, Scala. And I think it can do all of those, but I, I, you're right. If I could get Eclipse set up correctly, the go-to stuff is, is totally awesome. But Eclipse can also do Emacs and VI emulating, right? So... In theory, if you could get the syntax highlighting right, you could still use all the macros and key commands and stuff just like Emacs. So I, at that point, someone would have to tell me what the downside would be. I'm it, not you're sure. You're right. You're right. If you could get support for like dot proto files, if you could get syntax highlighting for that, and you know Python, R, all the languages, if you could, if if Eclipse could be as fully featured as Emacs, then you should use Eclipse. I agree with that. Because you could just turn on the Emacs keys, right? Yes, but then the argument is it's it's so resource hungry, and yeah, I, it's true. That was a problem before, but now I mean, like this, this laptop I'm on isn't like the two top of the line. It still has 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah, I. There will never be one answer for everyone. That's true. But Jason tells you to use spaces and deal with it. Oh, yeah. There's there's never one IDE answer, but there is one tabs versus spaces answer, and it's spaces. <laughs> and and even if you use Eclipse, you should still know how to use VI or Emacs 1. Right. So, like, I still know how to use VI. So when I'm on another person's computer or doing something on a computer that's not configured, you still need to know how to do it and be reasonably efficient. Yep. A lot of people aren't, and then that's, like, a, a problem. So right. they just use Eclipse because it's the fastest way to get started i guess and then they become debilitated when it's not working or they have to they're using a new computer or whatever yep that's not good either yeah definitely yeah you should learn i mean emacs is so technically vi gives you complete coverage um i have been on a few very seldom have been on machines that didn't have emacs um but uh but yeah you should definitely learn one of the two um, and you should change your Eclipse to use spaces instead of tabs, please. <laughs> and make it dark, dark themed. Oh yeah, everything should be dark themed. I don't know why people don't do this, but like, I have my uh, my Mac OS OS ten is set up to be dark themed. All of my browsers are dark themed. Eclipse is dark themed. Everything should be dark themed. Like your eyes will thank you. Wow, I don't have everything dark themed, but I have all my coding stuff is dark themed. Honestly, like if I could find a way to invert everything but the graphics. Um, on every website, you know, some kind of Eclipse plugin, oh, wow. I would probably you, do it. That's pretty goth. <laughs> it's pretty goth. All right. I think it's time for the news. News. So the first news article is Hack, a typeface designed for source code. So Wow, it's almost like we planned that lead-in. What's that? Talking about IDEs. Oh, I know. And... Yeah, we totally set that up. We're, we're, uh, we've been doing this for too long. Uh, but, yeah, so Hack is pretty cool. I've looked into it. It's basically... I used to use Deja Vu for Emacs. Um, Hack is based on Deja Vu, which is which is comforting for me. But it, it has a few changes which I really like. One is the um, letters that are very slim, such as I and L, they purposely give them kind of a exaggerated serif that kind of hangs off to the right. Um, and so it kind of makes those um, kind of letters you know stand out a bit more. Um, it's monospace, of course, because it's designed for source code. And so when you have monospace, I and L kind of tend to look kind of weird. So it fixes that. Also, I mean, just some subtle things. Um, the O and the zero, the zero has a dot in the middle. So you can tell whether it's O or zero. Um, 
so she's got some things like that which I think are pretty cool. Um, so I ended up actually sticking with Deja Vu, um, not because I didn't like Hack, but because um, I couldn't really figure out a way without a lot of work to install it on every machine. You actually, to install a font, there's not like some command line trick you can do. You actually have to open up the font and, and go and install it. And so I'm still trying to figure out if there's a way to do that. Um, but uh, overall, if, if it was as easy as Deja Vu to get, I would I would be using it. I'm not gonna lie, I don't even know what I use. You just use I'm like the default? Font nerd. I just use whatever, yeah. Eclipse's default is pretty good actually, pretty good. I'm looking at it, I can't tell what's different other than like you said, the dot and the zero. The the eye. If you look at the eye on Deja Vu and on Hack, yeah, but I can't different. think like without looking at it, I can't tell what mine is. So, oh, I'd have to go look at whatever font I have by default. If if your eye is symmetric, then it's Deja Vu. Like if it's okay. symmetric across the y axis. Okay. Yeah. I am not. Uh, what do they call someone who's a font nerd? I, it has a name, but I forget. Really? Then maybe not. I'll look it up. All right. Speaking of uh, aesthetics. Uh, we have another article, the common filter in pictures. Uh, so not using common filtering for pictures, but describing how a common filter works using pictures. Um, the first time I saw an explanation for the common filter that was sort of like this, I believe was in one of the, uh, what uh, the guy who does the Google self-driving car stuff has the online course. Uh, Sebastian uh, Thrun. Yes. That one, I think he has a video presentation about um, common filtering, particle filters, and Bayesian analysis uh, that he does through, and it was really good. And that was the first time I'd seen it presented a similar way to this article, but this article also does a very good job. Um, and basically talking about kind of how if you use if you think about it kind of in the Bayesian way and like what happens as you take measurements and update them and graphically showing the kind of distributions in a way that helps you kind of to more intuitively understand what the common filter is doing. I don't know that it gives you enough to where like at the end of it, you'd be able to like go implement it, but kind of understand where, where it's going. And even if you don't read the, like the actual formulas that are in here are, uh, they look foreign to me and I don't exactly know what they're saying. I'm sure if I sat down, I could probably work through most of it because I have actually implemented a common filter before. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I've forgotten it all since then. The pictures, though, do help tell a story and jogged my memory enough. And you know, I thought it was a good representation of why you would use a common filter. What does it do, do for you? How is it helpful? And that it's not just magic. Cool. Yeah, this looks awesome. I actually read uh, half of this article um, a few days ago, and I still have to read the rest of it. But it's awesome. I, yeah, I also highly recommend it. So, common filter in pictures. Yeah, oh, definitely check that out. and for those out. who don't know, we should say what a common filter is. Uh, oh. So a common filter is a way if you're taking, uh, and there's variations of it, but in the simple form, if you're taking measurements over time and the measurements have noise in them and you're trying to say uh, how believable is the measurement at a given point in time. Uh, yep, pretty much. It's just, it's so a recursive, like recursive Bayesian filter. So... The cool thing about it is because of the assumptions a common filter makes you it's you only need to know the current state to uh to infer the next state. So it's not like you have to store the entire history um in memory. And so that part is pretty cool. You, it's very memory efficient. Yep. And then you so you predict what the new state should be, then you take your measurement and then you basically adjust where to predict next based on that. Yep. Although people do all sorts of tricks, like take the last four states and make those states in the common filter, <laughs> so that like, oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've never seen that. There, there's, there's also ways of doing tricks. it where you have multiple measurements. Oh, what is that called? Consensus, right? Is that right? Oh, you, you some take kind of voting. Similar. Well, you have things that are measuring stuff similarly but differently. Like if you have an inertial measurement unit, you have like two of them and they'll give you slightly different answers and you put them both into the common filter in hopes of getting a better answer out if their way that they have error is different from each other. Right, that's right, yep. So that was a bad example, but oh, like dead reckoning on a car. So if you have a car, you can count like the rotation of the wheel, but the wheel slips a lot, right? So like how many times the wheel went around isn't a great measurement on its own, but if you combine it with like GPS, 
you know, like the strengths and weaknesses of the two complement each other very well, and you end up with a better estimate. Exactly. Yep. There we go. That's a good example. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Very cool. Um, so this next story is an honest guide to San Francisco startup life. Um, honestly. <laughs> honestly. So this here's the thing. This article. I don't know if it's true or not. I've never worked at a startup. <laughs> Um, I've Wait, never it lived says in honest San right in the title. It's, no, it's on the internet, but it's got to be true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honest, he really shouldn't have put honest, but, but uh, I mean, you know, it's 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 hilarious, is what it is. Um, the guy is absolutely hilarious. He has a um, he has a way of writing, like a sarc- a sense of sarcasm that I really appreciate. Um, like I, I'll just I'll just read an excerpt for it. Um, he's talking about getting to work. Uh, he works in the city. He lives not in SF um, because he works at a startup and he goes on about how he can't afford to live in SF and everything. But but he said, uh, you know, driving to SF is like a theme park ride, blah, blah, blah. But then he goes, those with a death wish ride a bicycle to work. It's easy to spot a cyclist. If you see a guy with one side of his jeans rolled up to the shin, he's a moron. If you see a guy on a bicycle, he's a cyclist. <laughs> I don't know. You got to read this. It's hilarious. Um, a lot of it is is true. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is a tongue in cheek article. It, it's very tongue in cheek. Uh, very very funny. Um, it so does, he works you know, in South of Market, which is being South of Market. But he says that's what the returns all the startups should expect. <laughs> yeah. Right. Worse than Market. Oh, yeah. that's terrible. It's so funny. So definitely check it out. I mean, it does give you uh, insights into working at a startup in SF or just being in the Bay Area in general, if you're interested. Um, so there are, you know, there is, there is, uh, there are academic aspects of this article, but, but as Patrick said, I mean, it's just tongue in cheek. Wait, I'm going to quote funny. this tomorrow at work. <laughs> Which Company, one? Bay Area companies have obvious names. Evernote makes note-taking apps. Optimizely lets you optimize your websites. Google lets you Google anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Oh, man. Maybe this is not funny to any of our listeners who don't live in this area, which is all of them. Yeah, I mean, it goes into everything like, you know, bring your dog to work, you know, having an exercise ball as a chair. I mean, all the things that... But does that happen in a lot of places that aren't like Seattle or San Francisco, San Jose? I'm pretty sure these phenomena only happen in, I mean, maybe in Austin. I don't know. But definitely, you know, obviously it's, the density is much higher in SF of this kind of craziness. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a, a it's quote, funny unquote, because honest it's true. guide. <laughs> yeah. So the next news article I have is not news, but a contest, the underhanded C contest. And I must have, I thought I had read something uh, recently about this. And then I saw that I was like uh, looking on their website and I saw they have a new challenge. So I must have been reading results of a previous challenge. Um, but I thought this was really clever. So you may have heard of the obfuscated C contest. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. It's not, this is like the worst thing ever. It's basically people doing all the things in coding that you should never do. Um, and did, like trying to write that, one-liners. Did you read that article about the top... Um, 20 things you can do uh, to, to like the, the top 20 things you can do right before you quit a job you hate. Oh, I did see this. Oh, yes, one of them this is was, terrible. I don't want to talk about any of them one because of them was I feel like pound, anyone who does that is a terrible person. <laughs> one of them was pound define break to space. And so what that means is there's no compiler errors, but all of your breaks just disappear. It's like all of your case statements and your switches just fall through to the next one. Um, you know, if you ever have a while true, it just never ends. And, but but there's no compiler error. <laughs> but they're all like that. There was like redefining true to be false or something. <laughs> yeah, it was so Oh, bad. no, I think it was redefining true to be a random number generator. <laughs> so good. No, it's so, so bad. Delicious. Don't oh, do man. that. Don't do that. Don't ever so, do that. Yeah. So this is underhanded similarly to those things, I guess. Um, but basically they present kind of a scenario that's supposed to be a real world challenge and it has kind of like a simple solution. It's not like a programming challenge to actually figure out how to do. It should be really straightforward and how to actually be able to accomplish the scenario they're putting forth. But then your goal is to try to put, um, 
flaws into the code that are very difficult to detect, but you have to send your source code, right? So you post your source code and you could do things uh, like kind of Jason is uh, alluding to, like maybe you pound to find a macro that does something unusual, but it's hard to detect. Or, um, and, and so like in, in any case, you're trying to leak information that you shouldn't be. So in the case they have now, I think you're a nuclear arms inspector uh, work, or trying to sabotage nuclear arms inspectors by allowing the certain countries to influence the results of nuclear power tests. Um, and you, your code will get inspected and it needs to kind of, your bugs have to slip through the inspection. Ah, I see. Uh, That's so cool. you have to do, you have to do things like maybe subvert how a, the date function is working or have a clever integer underflow that when it happens deliberately does something else. Um, and anyways, you can read through previous results. There's several years of uh, previous results. And he kind of, uh, I think it's a professor, he or she posts up uh, kind of like analysis of the, the best ones. And short and simple ones tend to win because it seems less sinister. And people will, you know, kind of like just glance over it like, oh, it's so short. How could there possibly be anything evil going on here? Versus if you write just mountains and mountains of unreadable text, people are going to, you know, be suspicious. Ah. So... I would check it out. It's an interesting approach to thinking about how to break something, which hopefully helps you not to do it yourself. This is amazing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like I could spend like a whole day just looking at this website. This is so good. Oh, this is so good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So this is amazing. So we've talked about looking at fonts and describing to them to you visual like then we talked about a web uh tutorial that was a picture oriented <laughs> so now jason is just simply describing to us his feeling oh, about looking at underhanded c code i think maybe we should go back to being on twitch i stopped doing the twitch thing because no one was really on it but well, uh some people some people were but yeah it's just hard right like people aren't all in this time zone and... yeah exactly but but this is the kind of thing that if i had been streaming my laptop uh display like it would uh the people on twitch would have actually seen what we were talking about anyway you guys yeah. we're gonna post all the links to the blog so, so the one uh, line the i was blog, thinking about that's in good. this uh what to do before you leave your company is hide yeah it was pound defining if as a macro that instead of if you do if and then you have something inside of the if instead it does the thing that's inside of the if and a random number is basically that evaluates to true 99% of the time. <laughs> so 99% of the time, it'll just be whatever you have inside of the parentheses. In other words, it'll operate exactly as you intend it. But then 1% of the time, it's just going to return false for no apparent reason. <laughs> and so then when you oh debug God. it, right? Like if, if you're not, depending on how you're debugging it, you're <laughs> likely to just be like, nope, it's right. It's right. Why is it not working? And then why is it wrong? <laughs> This is so amazing. The only thing about this file is, oh, I guess you're supposed to use a piece of this file because there's some duplicated things here. Yeah, you need to hide some of it. And you need to scroll it away or it'd be too obvious, right? <laughs> if you just put all of these in one place. Like I'm actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of this file and put it in our like uh, logging.h at the top. And I'm going to submit the code review just for fun. Oh. Um, this is actually our week of test or we're supposed to be testing things so this would be a, so this, when I do GDB debugging well and you've pound defined if to something else I'm trying to think if you're doing it just line by line I don't think you would ever be able to tell this even if you were like line by line GDB debugging something right. Yep. but I tend to be really paranoid and I typically drop to assembly very quickly <laughs> oh really? and then I would see it Yeah. I've actually never done that ever really? Yeah, I don't even I know spent how a to non, do that. non-trivial amount of time last week writing uh, custom world assembly. Wow, yeah, I have no idea how to do that. Does that really help? I mean, I feel oh, like yes. GDB is as low as you ever need to get. No, it, it was really good. Wow. So, okay, good to know. The thing I was looking for is I really wanted, uh, regardless of what optimization level you're at, I wanted something that had a very specific performance. And so I knew I could do it in two instructions taking three cycles, and the compiler was only getting down to like five instructions, seven or eight cycles. Uh, and so what I was worried is that someone would later find better optimizations and would change the timing uh, inadvertently. And I needed it to have very specific timing. Wow. That's amazing. Um, uh, cool. Yeah, so not, not time amazing. for book of the show. Book of the show. show. 
My book of the show is entrepreneurial. It's the hard thing about hard things. Which so what is, is the hard thing? The hard thing about hard things is so that hard? you don't know the answer and uh, you don't know if you're going to succeed or not. Oh, I thought you were going to say that you don't know that they're hard. Um, that no. would be deep. Well, so, I oh, mean, okay. I agree with you, but uh, according to the book, you definitely know uh, that you're in hard times, but uh, but you don't really know what the right answer is. And so this is from Ben Horowitz. So if you've ever heard oh, of... Oh, Andreessen and Horowitz. That's right. If you've ever heard of Andreessen and Horowitz. So they... Andreessen... Uh, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz both founded Netscape, I believe, or like we're, we're, you know, founding engineers on Netscape. I could be wrong about that, but um, Ben Horowitz was definitely founding engineer on Netscape. And uh, it's all about actually Ben Horowitz. It's a lot about Ben Horowitz's life. Uh, It was pretty interesting. I mean, at one point he was doing a startup. He was feeling really good about the startup. And then he had some family trouble um, he had a daughter who was born with severe autism and he needed medical, you know, benefits, things like that. So he was forced to quit the startup that he founded and get, you know, quote unquote, like a, like a corporate job. And then, uh, uh, worked there for a while, went back to startups and all about sort of the crazy volatility. Um, you know, his startup was completely falling apart and so he had to sell it. And so it's this craziness where he's got talented people, so it's kind of worth money, but it's really kind of an aqua hire because he doesn't have a good product, but people don't know he has a bad product yet. And it's all about how he kind of pulls that off and sells the business for like a, a ton of money. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, it talks a lot about even, they, they basically, this one guy, it talks a lot about B2B, which is, for people who don't know, that's business to business. So most jobs are business to business. Like, for example, like Facebook is business to consumer. There's all these people, they come to Facebook, and it, actually, is Facebook even b to, I think I, Facebook is actually business to business because advertisers come to Facebook, and then Facebook, um, you know, displays their That's not what they mean when they're talking, well... That yeah, it's part kind of, of on it the is business to but business. Yeah. Th- the the point is like uh, so a lot of these B two B, you know, companies they have a very few clients, especially this would be more startups. like Square, right? Like Square is squarely. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Square is very like business to business oriented, right? There, yep. I mean, individuals are using it, but they're really out there to like help small businesses. Exactly. So they're a business selling stuff to small business. In this case, a service, but. So this guy's startup, they literally, they had one customer that was 90% of the revenue. And this one customer was complaining to them because he wanted to use this one piece of software, but he couldn't get permission to use it. He only had permission to use their software, which they were orthogonal. It's like they were competing, but he wanted to use this other piece of software. And he was just really mad. And in general, they were saying he hated his life and he told them he was just like depressed and everything. But yet he was like in control of their whole whole business. So, so what they did, they bought this company only so that this one client would get access to this company's software without needing approval. So it's like imagine that. I mean, you buy a company just to make this one guy happy, um, and then because that guy was happy, he funded them for another year, and then they got bought or something. It was just it's like like crazy things that you never thought would happen um, at the highest levels. Of uh, of business happen, and uh, this book talks about them. It's very interesting. Very good. Mine is a work of science fiction. Steel. Oh, not the book itself is real, but it's a science fiction book. Ah, okay. It's called Steel World by B. V. Larson, and it's about. Oh, I don't. I never. I don't really want to spoil it, but it is set in the kind of near future, and Earth is only one of many. Uh, planets that have people on them and the guy is basically becoming a mercenary to fight battles for other planets uh, and kind of his going through that and <clears throat> the storyline actually sounded kind of cheesy I, I got the uh, book during an audible sale and so I was like so because I, I listen to most of my books mm-hmm. all of my books I'm not going to lie um, and because uh, I have a terrible commute and uh, so I was listening to it and I was like oh, I got it on sale I'll try it out and I was kind of like meh but then I really got into it and I was really like digging it by the end. So I really recommend it. Cool. 
Um, well, you gave me so good advice kind of with Ready Player One, so so I'll take your word on it. <clears throat> it has some interesting concepts in it. It's definitely not hard sci-fi, or at least oh, good. by my standards. That's good. Yeah. For me, I'm reading good. currently a one that is very hard sci-fi, and I'm finding it kind of boring. Um, yeah. So I'll probably have it as my recommended book of the show next week, but that's not a good endorsement. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, hopefully it has a twist at the ending or something. Uh, maybe maybe I'll finish another book in between. Um, <laughs> but definitely Steel World was good. It's uh, actually part of a series, uh, the Undying Mercenaries series, which gives a little bit of a clue, but I won't tell you what it was because it was a surprise to me, and I enjoyed finding out what the surprise was once I... I uh, heard it, but cool, cool, Anyways. cool. Uh, and then, as I'm, we've talked about previously, if you would like to get uh, that sounds so silly. Oh well, um, if you would <laughs> like to get a free trial to Audible, uh, they're offering one month uh, free subscription where you get one free book, and then you get to keep it when your trial's over. Just cancel it before the end, and there's no charge to you. And you can do that and support the show by going to www.audibletrial.com/ programming throwdown all lowercase all one word and that helps support the show we've had a number of people um do audible trials through that and that's really helped us out thanks guys and hopefully you enjoyed whatever books you picked write in and tell us what books you picked or give yeah, your own book you, of the show recommendations because yeah, we read you, a lot uh, and yeah if you get the hard thing about hard things or steel world and you like them or you hate them let us know well, if you hate them, don't tell us, please. Because then I'll just feel guilty <laughs> that I made you get something you didn't like. Well, maybe if you hated it compared to another book that's actually way better that we didn't like. Ah, know about. there we go. Constructive criticism. That's right. All right. Time, time for, for Tool of the Show. T -t 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 tool of the Show. So, my Tool of the Show is Electron, which is made by GitHub. It used to be called Adam Shell, um, but it's pretty cool. So, basically, it's a Node.js library. And um, the way it works is, so a simple way of saying it is you can take a website and turn it into a desktop app, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we definitely, we have some internal websites at work that would be kind of just much better if they were desktop apps because, you know, you want them to live on the dock. It's kind of weird if they're just a frame, you know, because they kind of do so much. Um, and so what this thing does is you... Um, you can actually even just take the example. Um, if you're not like a Node.js expert or anything, it's fine. You can just take their example code. Um, but it uh, has this sort of app. Like It's kind of hard to explain, but it has a OS X, Windows, Linux, desktop apps. And in the app is a folder. So in the case of OS X, apps are folders. So you just put it in the app folder. Um, in the case of Linux and Windows, um, they do something kind of goofy, but it works. I think it's like some kind of executable zip or something. But um, but uh, you just kind of, you have this Node.js code, which could be as simple as just one line that says open URL www.google.com. Um, and now you have the, a google.com app. Um, but, you know, typically you would have it point to some, you know, internal app for some internal site. Or, or if you have, you know, you can make a Facebook app. It's kind of cool. Um, I would imagine for things like Google and Facebook, there are probably professional versions. Like people have probably done all sorts of cool stuff that you can leverage. Um, but if you have, you know, a site of your own, or if you have your your company wiki and you want to make a desktop app for that, you could do that. So just think of it as kind of like a desktop wrapper around. So it websites. just like opens its own browser, but the browser is just your app. Exactly. It uses the. Uh, Chrome Embedded Framework, CEF. Um, but yeah, you basically, you give it the title of your app and you give it an app icon. And so, you know, it just it just launches that app, but the window is just a browser window. Um, and uh, it's pretty cool. Definitely check it out. All right. Yeah, I'm looking for like screenshots, trying to see what it looks like, but I can't find any. Uh, it Basically, it looks like you opened a browser um, you can choose, but there's no back and forward. That's right. There's none of and that. No, no address bar. Um, you can choose actually whether you want the address bar or not. Oh, okay. Um, so it's just a flag when you uh, when you write the Node.js code. So yeah, if you don't have any address bar, then uh, then it's literally like it, it feels a lot like an app. But then also if you if you don't have an address bar and you don't have back and forth, then you as the web developer has to make sure that you. Uh, allow people to navigate to where they need to go. Yeah. 
My tool of the show is not a tool, but a game. Surprise! <laughs> uh, and this is Does Not Commute, uh, which is an awesome name for a game. And in That's this right. game, uh, which is free to download on iOS, I don't know if there's an Android port. I guess I should have looked that up. Oh, well. Uh, um, I will look it up I actually now. don't know what the business model is. There uh, is an Android app. There is. Oh, awesome. Yep. You should check it out. Apparently, it's telling me get premium checkpoints if I buy, but I'm just saying not now. And what it is is it shows you a little top-down view. Like, what was that? The original Grand Theft Auto was like that, right? Or yeah, whatever. that's right. It's like yeah. the top-down view of the car. And you basically uh, steer your steer your car left or right through a neighborhood trying to steer a car to a destination. Except that once he gets there, you immediately start in a new location with a new car and you need to drive it to a destination. Except that time is running in parallel with the previous car you drove, which is now also driving on the street you're trying to drive on. So oh. it's following the path you chose to take. And then you're driving through it, and then you keep doing this over and over again um, until kind of like a certain certain number of cars or whatever. <clears throat> but your street is getting more and more busy as all your previous runs are stacking on top of each other. Uh, and if you collide with yourself, now there's an accident. You need to drive around the accident um, and this kind of thing. So it's okay. Really so I fun just concept. verified. I just verified. Does not commute. I looked at the in-app purchases. It only has one in-app purchase, and that is does not commute premium. So, so my guess is at some point you know you'll have to pay two dollars, which is really not bad, but it's not a pay to win. So, oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, it's not yeah, Jason like, was concerned about that. Yeah, the thing that scares me on free apps is like if I go to the in-app purchases and it's like a hundred ruples or a hundred like some weird currency for ten bucks, then I know it's kind of you know stay yeah. away. I kind of knew it wouldn't be like that. But anyways, for me, it's just like I didn't need like I didn't need to keep playing it. It was just a really clever idea, and I liked playing it for a few minutes. I don't know that I would play it till it was over or the end, right. all the levels. Um, just check it out for like kind of a really cool, clever, original concept, which don't feel like they come along that often. Yeah, definitely. It looks great. Cool, cool. So our language our- for today... Our language show. is R. R, matey. So R actually came from S, and we'll talk all about that. Wait, but um, R is before S. R, oh, R is before S. Oh, man, that totally messes everything up. <laughs> uh, so this is a By messes everything up, you mean doesn't matter, but yes, yeah. continue. This is a suggested language. Uh, John Williams, thanks for writing in. He suggested we do R. Back in May, or a little (laughs) late, but better than ever. Yeah, well, you know, we we definitely uh, keep track of everything, so uh, we got to you eventually. Um, And also, Alfredo Galagos uh, wrote in, and he was kind of wondering, what is data science, what is data analytics, and what is R? So we had had two people kind of both interested, um, and uh, this is something we we know a lot about, so this is a a good topic for us to cover. so I guess... So what is data science? Yeah, before we get into R, let's kind of talk about data science, data analytics. This is kind of... Um, you hear a lot of different things, like Alana Mitt, who's a pretty famous mathematician who worked at Google um, for a while. He says a data scientist is a statistician who works in San Francisco. <laughs> so, that is truth. Yeah, there's, there's definitely an element of truth to that. Um, but basically, so data science is this. Um, it's maybe easiest to talk about through uh, some kind of example, right? Um, let's say you are um, trying to sell tickets to a baseball game, right? So you want to figure out a good price for tickets. So you have a bunch of data that has, um, you know, let's say you have all of StubHub's data. So you know on the secondary market um, how much people charged for tickets, how much people paid, you know, how, how many of those tickets that were on sale were purchased, things like that. Um, and you want to build kind of some model, like you want to understand this data so that you could make your own, you could do price gouging on StubHub <laughs> so, uh, or arbitrage on StubHub. So um, you might say, well, let's just take, um, you know, the name of the team uh, that's playing. Let's just say you just focus on one stadium. So the home team's always the same. Uh, let's just take a, you know, the away team and take the average of the prices of the tickets. And so, you know, for the Cardinals, it's $17. And so I'm going to charge $17. Well, 
that probably won't work, right? Because there's different levels. And if you charge $17 for front row seats, then you know, you're giving somebody a great deal, but you're not, you haven't accurately uh, described the price of those tickets, right? So you go back and you say, okay, um, I'm going to, you know, take into account the different levels of seats. And now for each, for each category of seats, I'll have a different price structure. And now you're a little bit better off. Um, and then you found out, oh, when, when uh, they played on Saturday, um, you know, the tickets were much more expensive. But when they played, you know, Tuesday afternoon, the tickets were much cheaper because the accessibility, right? People work on Tuesdays. So, um, so you know, from looking at the data, you learn that. And then you decided, I need to add day of the week, or at least I need to add weekday, uh, yes or no, to, to, um, to my data. And so I need to split the model again um, and now just look at you know, two, uh, weekdays with the cardinals and see if that data is more regular. And so that's basically what a data scientist does, is they take the existing data and just kind of start slicing it up uh, to the point where they can end up with very regular, you know, nice distributions. Um, and, you know, presumably they could do this on a small subsection of data and that would scale across all the data, all the rest of the data. So in other words, we just talked about how to handle, um, you know, the giant stadium, but presumably that same logic applies to every baseball stadium. Um, so that's how a data scientist can can kind of look at small slices of data and hopefully still solve the bigger problem, right? So um, that's a big part of it, is, is that's the analysis part. Um, there's also uh, building models. So most of the time there's a goal of, of data science. So in, the, in this case, we wanted to um, become a ticket arbiter on uh, StubHub. So we want to know the uh, effective value of a ticket. And so that becomes a regression problem, right? So given um, all the things we know about the ticket, and then also we can use other data sources. We could go to mlb.com and see, you know, are the Giants having a good year or a bad year? Are the Cardinals having a good year or a bad year? Because that, that affects the sales, right? So using all this data, um, can we feed it into some machine learning model? And it would just spit out, you know, oh, $57 a ticket for this ticket and, and, uh, and be pretty accurate. Um, you might want to not just assign numbers to, to data that you don't know about, like in this case, future tickets. You might want to classify them. Like you might just want to say, okay, I don't want to know exactly what it's worth. I just want to know which ones are, you know, uh, selling for too cheap so that I can go and buy those and then resell like them. Which ones will sell out versus not sell out. Exactly. And so that's classification, right? That's more of a categorical task where you want to say, is it A or is it B? Um, you also want to do clustering. So, um, for example, let's say you don't know um, which tickets are, let, let's say like in the data, you don't have low level, high level. Like, like you don't know which, which seats are front row seats, but you know that people will charge more for front row seats. So you could do a clustering. You could say, okay, given all the tickets at the Cardinals game, I want to cluster it based on price into two groups. And I'll just assume the second group is the front row seat group. Um, then there's also data embedding, which uh, is gets a little bit more complicated, but that's all about understanding the distance between two things. So you might want to know, are these two tickets similar or different um, you know, with respect to their value? And so embedding is a way to do that. Um, and so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, there's data science uh, competitions and they also have tutorials on Kaggle.com. So that's K-A-G-G-L-E.com. Uh, it's pretty cool. So that even their tutorials are actually fake competitions. Like they're, they're competitions that where there's no deadline and there's no prize. But, but you still get a feeling like you're, you're doing this competition. And it kind of gets you set up to do the real competitions. Um, I've done a few of them. They're really fun. Uh, I've never been in the top 10 or anything crazy like that. A lot of those people are, are just extremely good. Um, but, uh, but it's definitely worth checking out and you'll have a good time. So what would you say is the difference between statistics or what you learn in like, let's say a college undergraduate level statistics class and what data science is about? Um, yeah, good question. So 
Well, in undergrad, you mainly learn how to you know, get the statistical properties of data. So you learn how to fit to a distribution, you know, what the uh, confidence intervals mean, things like that. Um, in most classes, even graduate classes, they don't really talk about how to sort of, I don't know if normalize is the right word. Clean up the data. But exactly, like how to, uh, people will tell you, okay, given some data, here's how you can check and see if the data is normally distributed. What that means is that you can find a Gaussian or a normal curve that sort of fits the density of the data. So, you know, for example, if there's a lot of data around 20, and as you get further away from 20, there's kind of less and less data, then you could kind of fit a Gaussian curve where the center is at 20, right? But they don't really tell you is, if your data is not that, then what do you do, <laughs> right? So that's not really covered. And the answer is kind of, as we talked about, you do this segmentation. Um, also, you have to do, as Patrick said, you have to do a lot of cleanup. Uh, might be, you know, some people will post a ticket on StubHub and charge $50,000 just because they can, because they're just crazy, or who knows, like they just think it's cute or funny, or they think, oh, there's a chance that some insane person's gonna buy this ticket, let me just see what happens. And so, you know, what that ends up translating to are just anomalies in the data that you have to filter out, otherwise they'll just completely dominate uh, any type of machine learning. Like it will spend so much energy trying to understand this, this, this ridiculous number that it will forget about the entire problem. <laughs> So, so, so data science is about all of that. So there's occasionally that happens on, this is not really related, but on Amazon, if you ever go look, especially I find it on like used books, if you ever look at used books that are out of print or don't have a current like yep. new edition. I've seen this with board games, used board games. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And it's almost like people have an algorithm which says people won't buy the cheapest used something. They'll buy the second cheapest used something. So find whatever the lowest priced used something is and like charge 3% more than it. And so then you end up with this weird race of like two or three people offering used books for sale for like $10,000. Yep. And it's like, but it's not like a rare book. It's just an out of print book. And for some reason, or like a previous edition of a book. And it's very unclear what caused it. But if you were doing data scraping and trying to say like, Hey, books on science fiction. What is is it worth collecting a random paperback book? And you know, you had in your data these things that are like ten thousand dollars, but that doesn't mean anyone's actually buying them. So it's not really a good measure of their net worth or of their actual worth. But it would still corrupt your data. That's right. Yep, you're exactly right. Now, yeah, even with board games, there's this game uh, Beyond the Hill. I think it's called. Um, and it was just, yeah, the game retailed for like $50, just a normal board game. Uh, but it was out of print and they were getting ready to release a new edition. Uh, I didn't know all of that. I just went to look it up on Amazon. And yeah, they said it's worth, you know, $50,000. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, all of that comes with your data. But I'm also curious why that happens in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I think you were right. I think it's it, there's some people with algorithms. Um, I would imagine there's people who just do data science on Amazon oh, and buy and sell things and they don't even know really what they're buying and selling. They just they Or they just, don't actually have it. They just plan to buy it from someone else. And so their plan is like one person's bot is trying to be the cheapest and then the second person is trying to be the second cheapest. And so then they just race each other. Right. Yep. Uh maybe. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know. It's like high frequency trading of Amazon. Only in this one, no one actually ends up buying it because there's nobody on the other side. Yeah, exactly. I wonder how many high frequency trading companies have like one or two percent of their of their revenue are just broken algorithms, and they just expect to lose that. Like they have a budget of a hundred million, and every year one or two million just gets invested in a completely bogus way because of some some race like this. Someone said that there's like a, a group of people kind of uh, doing, it's not really high frequency trading because like high frequency trading means something slightly different, but algorithmic trading where, you know, it's just like a computer running a program, not at like a super high speed, but that right. basically That's as humans- That's what is, right? Um, yeah, but that means something different. There's other ones that watch like for a pattern. Right? If you've seen a stock is up 10% in the last month and it's currently down more than 2% in the last day, buy it because chances are it'll be up again 
And gotcha. so it might operate over the course of hours or days, um, but there's no human intervening. Um, gotcha. And so it's algorithmic, but not high frequency. Uh, although yeah, more sense. frequent than maybe you or I might trade stocks. Anyways, right, right. Um, and so if you find them, like you can tell how they behave because they act in a certain way, like not like a human per se. And then basically if you find these, people leave the bots running for some period of time because they're initially profitable. Then, you know, basically people figure out whatever is being done and close down the profit by closing the arbitrage. And then for some while they're, they're just like break even and then they become, you know, get shut down when they basically start losing money. But if you can uh, find the ones that are still lurking out there that have gone break even, you can trick them into like taking the other sides of your orders and <laughs> like make money off of them. But That's I've awesome. never seen anyone I've like know firsthand actually demonstrate this phenomenon to me. So maybe it's just urban myth. Uh, yeah, I don't know. A lot of this, a lot of stuff in the stock exchange, I don't, you just have to be there and we're, we're not there. So, <laughs> but I would believe it. I mean, I definitely, I'm not skeptical of that. I'm pretty sure something like that happens. I mean, definitely if you're doing algorithmic trading, you probably are taking advantage of other algorithmic traders. That's my guess. I mean, maybe not, maybe not knowingly, but at any yeah, rate. I don't know. So, I don't know. all right. Back yeah. To so R. let's talk about R. So it is open um, source. That's a good thing. It is open source. If you've ever used MATLAB, um, you know how frustrating it is. Um, you know, there is Octave. You know, we, t we had a whole show on MATLAB and Octave. Um, but Octave is, um, has kind of some issues. Um, actually, they're similar to R, so we'll talk about that. Um, but, but it's when, hard. The problem with MATLAB to Octave is if, like, and this gets back to the B2B thing you were saying earlier, if you're at work, you probably aren't going to use Octave if you work for a big company because it's better for them to just pay for MATLAB no matter how much it costs. Right, right. And you just deal with it. So then when you go home and you try to use Octave, it's different enough that it's frustrating. Yeah, you're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, so, so R is totally open source. Um, there's there's some like R Studio and things like that where they cost money if you're a company, but they're free if you're an individual. So that kind of solves the problem Patrick was talking about. Um, one thing about R that's different than MATLAB. So so R is you know matrix based, you know kind of linear algebra, um, um, you know based language. But one thing is very different is R sports this thing called data frames, and data frames are awesome. It's basically like Think of it as like a SQL database in memory. That's kind of the best way to explain it. Um, so imagine if you had the SQL database or many of SQL databases sitting in memory and the entire sort of language that you're, that th all the code that you're writing can kind of take advantage of that database. Like you have these sort of pseudo SQL statements um, right inside of your code. So your code might say, you know, grab this data and then take all the rows where this one column is greater than 0 0.5. And now you have a new SQL database that just has those rows. Um, and then you know, do some other things to it and then do a group by and things like that. So it's, it's really powerful. Um, it's very cool, highly recommended. Um, <clears throat> I recently, well by recently I mean like three years ago, I switched, <laughs> not that recently, I switched from MATLAB to R and uh, um, I think it's great. I'm a big fan. It has tons of packages. Um, almost all the packages work on every operating system, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it even has support for big data. So there's this thing called RMR. Um, I actually have never used it, so uh, but it looks pretty cool. It looks like it'd be it'd be pretty intuitive. Um, it does MapReduce in R, and so the idea is, if you have a big cluster full of machines, um, as long as you use the RMR variant of the various uh, functions, it will know to ship that data off to the cloud, um, you know, crunch on the numbers and then and then ship back the result. Um, some of the cons about R is, uh, it's like many open source projects, it's got this very fragmented community. Um, the documentation is, to be honest, pretty terrible. Uh, the documentation on R itself is great. But R kind of lives or dies by its packages, which is true for most of these languages. And the documentation, like if you're used to, you know, the Apache Commons um, kind of documentation and just in general, the, jo the kind of documentation you see on Java products, uh, projects, you'll be just supremely disappointed. <laughs> so the, the documentation in R's, in R's packages is pretty terrible. Um, 
But you're mostly <laughs> using R for so like difference like Python. Python is used for scripting, but a lot of people do build applications with it. But I've never, I mean, maybe you have. I've never seen anyone even try to build like an application with R. It's always like a script that runs, right? Like an application in that it runs from start to finish, but not like uh, like what you would normally build with like C or Java or C++. Yep. Yeah, you're right. So people are um, using it to do a series of analyses and produce an output as opposed to like building a GUI with it. Exactly. Yep. Um, yeah. So there's uh, many of the packages kind of lack support. Uh, there's front ends that are kind of in various states of disrepair, kind of like we talked about Qt Octave being uh, discontinued uh, back on the MATLAB episode. So it's similar to R. I mean, R Studio is actually um, has a lot of traction, and now it's it's definitely in a good place. But the rest of them are basically defunct. Um, yeah. For example, just to sort of like illustrate this. There's this library, there's this package called Zoo for handling time series. And uh, all I wanted to do was I had some data that was not regular across time. So in other words, you know, some of the, like one of the data might be from Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Friday and Thursday is just missing. And so I just wanted to linearly interpolate all of the days that were missing. And the Zoo... Uh, a package that it would just do that. And so I thought, oh, great, I don't have to do it myself. Um, I'll just use this package. And it just, it took me a whole day just because the documentation was kind of terrible. I kept getting weird errors. And uh, um, and so that's that's just something you kind of have to deal with. But uh, then when, once you get kind of better at R, uh, and once you've kind of gone through the rigor, uh, the ringer, then uh, uh, then it's it's awesome. And it has an incredible power. You already spoiled that it was based on S. That's from right. Bell Labs, which seems to be the source of like everything in modern day life. I know, isn't that amazing? Do you know anybody who worked at Bell Labs? No. Is Bell Labs still going? I guess it might be. I know yeah, Xerox sure. Park is still going because I have a buddy who works there, but Bell Labs, let me check. Yeah, no, I, I, it's just all mythical people from legend that worked at Bell Labs, but I yep. don't know anyone. Um, yeah, you go ahead and keep talking. about. I'm going to look up if Bell All Labs right. is still a thing. <laughs> it was developed at the University of Auckland by one Russ Ahaka and Robert Gentleman, um, used, deriving some of the ideas that they got from S. And as Jason pointed out, a big deal with R is finding packages to help you do what you would like to do because everyone likes doing less work. Um, but hopefully your package is easier to use than Jason's anecdotal experience <laughs> about his, uh, his time series plotting. And so some uh, ones that we use before, so Jason mentioned Zoo, although his uh, recommendation was kind of weak. Um, right. There's also plotting, lots of plotting ones, so ggplot2, uh, which allows you to use gnuplot from uh, within R, or gnuplot, I don't know if people spell it out or say it, um, and then if you need to do web visualizations, you could use HTML widgets. Uh, and if you're going to do some markdown, you could use R markdown. Yeah, definitely. So, so Bell Labs is still going. They had a couple of things pretty recently that, that, uh, that, that were noteworthy. Um, it said in July 2014, Bell Labs broke the broadband internet speed record with a nice. new technology dubbed XG Fast. That promises 10 gigabits per second connectivity speeds. Over what? So, uh, oh, um, 10 gigabits a second. That's not that impressive if you're talking about fiber. So I'm assuming they must be talking about the existing, you know, cable, right? I don't know. Yeah, because fiber can, I believe fiber... Wait, 10... Oh, no, sorry. 10 gigabits a second. That's a lot, actually. But it... No, that's like, well, gigabit Ethernet is a thing, right? Like, that's just a regular Ethernet. And there's also specialized, like, server stuff kind oh, of yeah, 10 yeah, gigabit you're Ethernet. Right. You're right, you're right. So, yeah. But, yeah, anyways. so It's uh, some sort of record. It sounds cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess not that much is happening. But people <laughs> probably weren't that excited when they heard about this thing called S or C, you know. I, 
But yeah, apparently like, the single letter program names at Bell Labs were the uh, heyday. Oh, interesting. Uh, a couple of a few months ago, Nokia bought Bell Labs. Oh, wow. Um, so anyway, so um, yeah. Wait, are there also, other programming languages that we use that came out of Bell Labs? So S, other than C no, we inspired R, C. Obviously, there was B. Yeah, that's right. B preceded C, but I've never used B. I've, I've never, never even seen B. B. No, Did D come out of Bell Labs? <laughs> Bell Labs. All right, well, this is going to be really boring. We can look this up later and, and prepare yeah. something. Um, so, so you already another, mentioned R Studio. Cool, uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. So so R Studio is a great GUI. There's also um, Rattle, which I haven't tried, but it looks pretty promising. But at this point, R Studio is kind of. I feel like there should be more pirate theming here. Is it just me that's onto the pirate theme? You have a programming <laughs> language named R. Like, come on. Oh, man. So if you want to learn how to be a pirate, um, you should go to tryr. Tryr. Tryr.codeschool.com. Do they have a code school for everything? Like, if I just went to code, code school. Code school is so big now. That guy, like, he writes, he's really prolific. Either that or wow. he's developed a platform and other people are writing. I don't know what the deal is. Right. But every Very time cool. I'm like, oh, I need to learn a language for the show, I'm like, code school. Oh, here we go. Um, and it seems really reasonable, like the business model, which is like often basically like the first one is free. And then if you want more advanced ones, you have to pay. Um, yeah, oh, it looks have, like they uh, may have changed now. They have Ruby on Rails, CoffeeScript, um, Git. More Ruby, jQuery, Objective-C. They have a ton of stuff. That's pretty cool. Am I thinking um, of something else? What's that? No, it's code school. Yeah. Huh. Okay, yeah. Sorry, they changed. I was looking at their pricing thing. They've changed how they're doing it now. So is it, what is it now? Is it better? I don't know. It says like there's a per month subscription. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Hmm. I don't understand what that means. All right. So, okay. I have no idea what code school, blah, 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 but... I've seen lots of good stuff in them before, so if you've never yeah, seen I mean, them, check it out. We both went through the R tutorial. I mean, we already know R, but we went through it, uh, you know, briefly, and uh, it looks. And Code School is who had the uh, Ruby on Rails for zombies, or right, whatever yep. it was. I before. actually did that course a long time ago. It's great. Um, very cool. So Rails that's R for zombies. In a nutshell, um, in a pirate hat, um, it's we pretty cool. should have had more pirate jokes. Missed <laughs> opportunity. I'm still sort of torn about R versus um, Python with pandas. So for people who don't know, pandas adds data frames to Python. So you know how I was talking about data frames, the whole like SQL kind of just built into your programming language. Um, pandas is a library for Python that gives Python that power. And so once you have pandas, I mean, Python is much better documented and things like that. Um, I still, I've been using R for so long, like three years now, so it's kind of hard to switch again to something else. Um, and R, R is definitely much more like MATLAB um, than NumPy is. But uh, um, but this is this is pretty cool, check it out. Definitely try R, you know, try, try Python. Wait, did you pandas. totally just undermine our entire podcast at the end by saying, if you're new to this, you probably should use uh, Python with pandas. But if not... <laughs> well, I think... It's hard to say. I mean, I think okay, you should try both. Okay, check them both out. Make your own decision. Tabs, spaces. Jason doesn't care anymore. Well, so the thing is, that it's not fair for me to say because I've been using Python for a decade. And so it's easy for me to feel like, oh, it's much more comfortable for me to jump into Pandas than R because I've been using Python for so long. That's why I'm kind of torn. Uh, so I, I feel like I'm biased here. So definitely try both. Uh, it's easy enough to pick up R and start doing some cool stuff. Um, R can uh, you know, ingest CSV, TSV, tab-separated files uh, very easily. It's just a one-liner. And uh, so it's easy to get up and running. Um, just to recap a few things. So the book of the show was The Hard Thing About Hard Things. This is my book of the show. Patrick's book of the show was Steel World. Um, my tool of the show is Electron. Uh, you can check it out on GitHub. Patrick says that uh, does not commute the iOS Android app. And uh, we actually, the Patreon is doing pretty good, which yes, is Yes, thank you. Cool. Some of our members, our listeners suggested that we recap at the end of the show for people who wanted to write it down at the end. 
Yeah, definitely. Type and in. thank you so much for your support on Patreon. That's definitely helping us um, in our bandwidth costs. We recently switched bandwidth. Uh, we switched uh, hosting providers. And so uh, let us know, especially if you have issues. So if, if, if downloading this episode was very difficult for you and it took three days or something kind of incredulous, um, tell us, let us know, because we're, we're kind of messing around with the infrastructure right now. And, uh, and uh, it's important to get that feedback. Yep. So thank you, everyone, who supports us on Patreon, uh, doing the Audible trials, uh, buying the books of the show, or using our Amazon links for doing that. That all that all that's helping us out, guys. Thanks. Yeah, we appreciate it. All right. Well, till next time. Yep. See you later. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.